Good morning. Welcome to Bethel Bible Fellowship. If you're a visitor here this morning, I want to extend a special welcome to you and let you know that we are in the midst of preaching our way through 2 Corinthians. So this morning our passage will be 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 2 through 9. If you want to turn there, we'll read it together. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, we'll begin reading in verse 2. Paul writes to the Corinthians, Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. Great is my confidence in you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort. In all our affliction, I am overflowing with joy. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice still more. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a little while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. Father, as we come to your word this morning, we ask you, to prepare our hearts. Where there's hardness, Father, we pray that you would till that soil. Where our minds are busy and preoccupied, Father, help us by the power of your Spirit to focus on your Word. Give us the faith, Father, to receive your Word, that it might grow in our hearts and bear fruit. Make us a people, Lord, that are able to live according to the pattern that Jesus gave us, as Paul did. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there are a few things in this world that are worse than loving someone who doesn't return that love. Love longs for a response. Paul loved the people at Corinth. They were his spiritual children. I mean, They were his friends. He lived in Corinth for a year and a half when he planted the church there. And as we begin our passage this morning, you can feel his heartache. Look at verse 2. He says, make room in your hearts for us. We've wronged no one. We've corrupted no one. We've taken advantage of no one. You can almost feel his pain. It's as though Paul is begging them to love him. I mean, sounds a little pathetic. It would be pathetic if it wasn't so Christ-like, right? Isn't that what Jesus does for us? He comes to us. He knocks on the door. He implores us to follow him, woos us to himself so that we would make room in our hearts for him. Paul says here, we've wronged no one, we've corrupted no one, we've taken advantage of no one. We have done nothing to harm any of you. In fact, Paul says, I have only ever loved you. Make room in your heart. Love me back. See, Paul's not just trying to clear his name here. He's not simply trying to get the Corinthians to see that he's innocent of the things that they're accusing him of. He wants their love. He wants them to make room in their hearts for him. Paul knew that if they closed their hearts to him, that they were also closing their hearts to his message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul said back in chapter 6, if you want to look at it, it's on the next page. He said in 6.13, In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. This isn't Paul being condescending, talking down to them like a bunch of kids. No, the Corinthians were his children. They were his spiritual children. He's the one who at great cost to himself had planted the church there in Corinth. But when Paul left, 
false teachers had come in and they had yoked themselves to these false apostles. And Paul's saying, guys, you can't have it both ways. You can't be making room in your heart for them and having me and my teaching in your heart. So when he said in chapter 6, verse 14, if you're still there, he said, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. That's exactly what he's talking about. When these false teachers came in, they came to Corinth with very impressive speaking style, with their rhetoric and their glitz and their eloquence. And compared to Paul, who himself admits he's not a very good public speaker, they won the day. And many of them were being drawn away. Not only drawn away from Paul, but drawn away from a pure gospel. If you'll turn with me to chapter 11. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> In chapter 11, Paul gives us some details about what's going on with these false teachers. Chapter 11, verse 2, Paul says, For I feel a divine jealousy for you. I love this. He says, Since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Paul sees his ministry of the gospel like that of a matchmaker. Here's Jesus. Jesus, here's the Corinthians. You know, you'd make a good match. Verse 3, he says, but I'm afraid that as the, the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, Paul admits it, he's a humble guy. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. Now look down at verse 12. Paul says he's going to continue to fight for the Corinthians no matter what in order to bring them back to a solid footing in the faith. Verse 12, he says, and, and what I am doing I will continue to do. I'm not going to give up on you guys. And I will continue to do it in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. Verse 13, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan himself, even Satan dis disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. See, this is no mere personality conflict that Paul's trying to get over. Paul's not hurt that his popularity is slipping. No, Paul is fighting for the souls of those in Corinth who are listening to lies and are being drawn away from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So, going back to chapter 7, verse 2, he says, make room in your hearts for us. We've wronged no one, we've corrupted no one, we've taken advantage of no one. In fact, if you look at it, Paul had gone overboard in this regard, in the opposite direction. I mean, it was Paul who had been wronged, and it was Paul who had been taken advantage of in order to bring the gospel to the city of Corinth. Over and over and over again, Paul recounts all the suffering that he endured in order to bring the gospel to Corinth. Now, We've read that, those passages several times. I know I have, I know Alexis has, and I'm not going to go back and read them, but all that can be summed up in chapter 4 where Paul said, we are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. So death works in us, but life in you. Paul risked his life for the Corinthians, and Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, than that a man lays down his life for his friends. And Paul had done that repeatedly for the church at Corinth. Now, Paul wasn't saying these things to make the Corinthians feel bad. He says in verse 3, chapter 7, I don't say this to condemn you. In other words, my defense of my love for you is not meant to be an indictment against you. I just want you to know how deeply and dearly I love you. And he says it again here in verse 3. You are in our hearts to die together, and to live together. Paul wants them to know that his friendship and his affection for them will always be there throughout life, even if that involves death. It'll never stop. Paul says, I'll never stop loving you. I'll never give up on you, no matter what. I hope you can feel Paul's heart here. 
his longing for complete reconciliation with the Corinthians. Not just on a personal level, but because he is the apostle to the Gentiles. And the message that he bears about the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so important that his personal relationship with them cannot stand in the way of that. He wants them to love him as he loves them. And more importantly, that they would maintain their pure and sincere devotion to Jesus Christ. And he's hopeful that that will happen. In fact, Paul seems to have pretty good confidence in this. He's a lot more optimistic than I am, even after studying this for a couple of weeks. Look at verse 4. Paul says, Great is my confidence in you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort, and I am overflowing with joy in all our affliction. Now, after all that we've said over the past weeks about the problems in Corinth, that statement should strike you as very surprising. Paul's got great confidence in them. He's boasting on their behalf. He says he's filled with comfort and overflowing with joy. Where does that come from? Well, in order to understand that, we have to understand the backstory. And in order to understand the backstory, we have to go back to chapter 2. So please, if you would, turn with me back to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul was talking about a different letter. Not 1 Corinthians, and not this letter, 2 Corinthians, but a letter that came in between those two. A letter that's sometimes called the severe letter, because it was hard on him. And we don't really know what that letter said, because we don't have it. God did not see fit to preserve it for us or to put it in the Bible. So all we know about that letter was that it was a forceful call to the Corinthians. Paul was calling the Corinthians out for their sin in a very forceful way. And in chapter 2, verse 4, he says, For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears. It was not an easy letter for Paul to write. Not to cause you pain, to let, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. See, Paul, at that time, when he wrote that letter, as with 1 Corinthians, he was in the city of Ephesus, which is on the eastern side of the Aegean Sea. And when he wrote this severe letter, he gave it to Titus, and he sent Titus as his envoy across the Aegean Sea to Corinth, over there in Achaia, to deliver the letter. Then Paul continued on his missionary journey, and he went north, and he ended up in Troas, which is in modern-day Turkey now. And he says in verse 12, still in chapter 2, When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I didn't find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. So Paul goes from Ephesus to Troas, in Troas, he's supposed to meet Titus. Titus isn't there. He's not sure what happened. So he goes all the way around over on the other side of the Aegean Sea to Ephesus, or excuse me, to, um, uh, to Macedonia, which includes cities that we're familiar with, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. <clears throat> and he's still looking for Titus, and he doesn't know for sure what happened to Titus. Now, at that point in the letter, in chapter 2, verse 13, Paul breaks off the, that narrative about his travels and his letter and the Macedonians, and he goes into a very long defense of his own gospel, the ministry of reconciliation. He explains what the ministry of reconciliation is. From chapter 2, 14, all the way to chapter 7, verse 4, it's a defense, Paul giving a defense for himself and for his ministry. And then in chapter 7, verse 5, if you want to turn back there, he picks up the story again. So everything that we've been covering for the past several weeks was Paul's defense, and now we're going back to that story that he started back in chapter 2, and he says in verse 5, when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. Paul was concerned about the church at Corinth, and I love this about Paul. He's not super confident about everything that he does. He's not strutting around imagining that I'm the apostle and so therefore everything I do is inspired. No. no he, he's just like the rest of us. He did his best and he's hoping for the best. But he wrote this strong letter to the church at Corinth and he sent it with Titus and now Titus doesn't show up like he's supposed to and Paul has no rest. 
He didn't know what happened. Did that letter, was it so strong that it pushed the Corinthians even farther away? Not just from Paul, but from Christ and the gospel? Had this letter caused a rift that was irreparable between Paul and, and the Corinthians? And what about Titus? If Titus brought this letter and the letter pushed the Corinthians over and they got angry, what might they do to Titus? Did they run him out of town or, or worse? I mean, he hadn't shown up yet. And he says here in verse 5, he says, We were afflicted on every side, fighting without and fear within. When Paul got to Macedonia, that wasn't the perfect place. He met persecution there. There was fighting without. And while he was dealing with the persecution against him in Macedonia, he had this constant burden on his heart for the church at Corinth and for Titus. What happened to Titus? In verse 6 he says, But God, who comforts the downcast, some versions say, But God, who comforts the depressed, comforted us by the coming of Titus. That's a pretty good translation. God, who comforts the depressed. God's deepest grace is there in our deepest need. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know who in here is discouraged or depressed. But I can tell you this, that God will always meet you there in that place of discouragement and brokenness. And the interesting thing is, he almost always does it through other people. Titus came to Paul to bring this comfort in the midst of his depression. God uses his people to comfort his people. When you're suffering, and you're discouraged, don't hold up and close the doors and pull the blinds. Get together with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Titus shows up there in Macedonia, and Paul is comforted, to say the least, and he's overjoyed. Not just that Titus was okay, but because of the news that Titus brought back. Look at verse 7. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, and not only... By his coming, we were comforted not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. The, the Corinthians had ministered to Titus when he got there, even though the letter was strong. And Titus told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice still more. For even if I, am made, to gr even if I made you grieve with my letter, I don't regret it. Well, I, I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you. Paul wasn't trying to hurt anybody. But there were hard things that had to be said. He says, I, I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a little while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting, for you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. Can you sense Paul's relief? I mean, he sends this letter. He has no idea what's going to happen, and yet now he finds out that the letter had its desired effect. A very strong letter with a stinging rebuke. But instead of stirring up anger, it moved people to grief, and a grief that ultimately led to repentance. And again here, we see Paul's humility. He says in verse 8, After I sent the letter, I had my regrets. Paul knew it was going to sting, and he couldn't predict how it was going to turn out. Paul wasn't strutting around some kind of alpha male bravado, expecting that everything he did was right. He knew how it was going to turn out. No, he's just like you and me, doing his best, hoping for the best, using Jesus as his model, knowing that if things could go south for Jesus and he could end up on a cross, then things could go south for Paul in his own ministry. What this does for me is it reminds me that we are not called to be successful in our ministry to people. We're simply called to be faithful. Success belongs to God. That's something he does. We're simply called to sow the word, to water it, to weed the garden. God will take care of the results. And sometimes that's hard work, and sometimes the weeding is difficult, especially in our hypersensitive, hypertolerant culture today. I mean, you open your mouth and you're a hater today. But sometimes, like Paul, we have to say hard things to the people we love. And I'm talking about Christians right now. We don't need to go out and try to correct the world. The world needs Jesus. 
not us nagging at them. But we don't have the luxury as believers in Jesus Christ to ignore sin in our brothers and sisters in Christ. We simply don't have that luxury. The consequences are too great. Now that doesn't mean that we're a bunch of Pharisees going around blasting people out of the saddle at every turn. No, look at Paul's heart in this passage. Look at how hard it was for Paul to do this. It made him uneasy, to say the least. But he loved these people and he had no choice but to say the truth to them. Now, at Corinth, on this occasion, things had taken a turn for the better. Look again at verse 17. Titus reported that the Corinthians had a longing and a mourning and a zeal for Paul because of the letter. And it comforts Paul's heart and it makes him rejoice. Now, please understand. This response in the church and the repentance that Paul's talking about is not the same throughout the entire church at Corinth. And this doesn't mean that they repented of every single sin in Corinth. This is talking about a very select group at Corinth and a specific sin. In chapter 12, verse 21, Paul says, I fear that I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented. There are people in Corinth who didn't repent. So there was need for repentance in other people, and there was also need for repentance for other sins. There were a lot of problems still in Corinth. There was a problem of immorality that we'll see in chapter 12. In chapters 8 and 9, we're going to see that they had made a promise to give some money to take up a collection for Jerusalem, and, and they hadn't followed through on it. We're going to see as we go through here that there are still people in Corinth who are still connected to the, the cultic worship at the temples. Not to mention that there was the ever-present problem of people following the false teaching of these false apostles. But Paul writes a letter about a specific sin, and the people repent. And in spite of all the other problems at Corinth, Paul's undeterred. They've taken a very good, very positive step, maybe a baby step, but they responded to Paul's rebuke with sadness and with repentance, and he commends them for that. And he rejoices with them. Paul is not going to abandon them in their imperfection any more than Jesus abandons us in our failings. And if that's all we get from the passage this morning, I'm happy. If all we grasp this morning is Paul's persistent heart in pursuing these wayward people in Corinth, then I feel like I've done my job. We could spend a lot more time talking about repentance this morning, and and probably should, but I'm going to entrust that to Joel because his passage next week Uh, goes on and talks about what real repentance is. And so I'm going to leave that over to you, Joel. What I want us to see here this morning is that people saw these, or Paul saw these people who were caught in sin, and like a shepherd who's lost a sheep, he relentlessly and gently goes after them, wanting to bring them back, to bring the unsafe to Christ and to bring Christians who are caught in sin to repentance. As I studied this passage over the past weeks, I couldn't help but see the heart of Christ in Paul. Paul is loving the Corinthians with the love of God, using Jesus as his model. And because of that, and because of what I've been reading recently, I couldn't help study this without thinking of another passage. Luke chapter 15. So if you have your Bible, please turn there. Luke chapter 15. And just to say this, if you ever walk in and, and, um, and you don't have a Bible, we have a lot of Bibles that are on that table back there. Those aren't for anybody. Maybe they're yours. If it's yours, please grab one of the lost Bibles. Otherwise, grab one so you have it when we go through this. But Luke 15, we're going to be here a while. We're going to read the whole chapter. I think this passage works perfectly into the heart of Paul in our passage this morning. If you've ever had the chance to read Timothy, Timothy Keller's book, The Prodigal God, you're going to recognize some of my comments in Timothy Keller's writing. All right, so, and if you've never read this book, I strongly uh, encourage you to do so. It's really, really, really a powerful book. He's, he's very good. All right, Luke 15, verse 1. And this whole chapter is one unit. It's a whole. 
Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them a parable. <laughs> Actually, Jesus proceeds to tell three parables here. And it's really important that we notice who his audience was. Right? He's, he's there, he's talking to the tax collectors and sinners, and then the Pharisees can't miss this opportunity to take a shot at Jesus and to criticize him and accuse him. And so Jesus, they're there, they're in the audience, so Jesus tells a story, and his audience is both the sinners and tax collectors and the Pharisees and scribes. And he tells this, these three stories, in a way that interconnects all three stories so he has a message for everybody in the audience. Verse 4. He says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Someday I want to preach a whole sermon on that word, until. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So he says to them all, if you had 100 sheep and one of them was lost, wouldn't you go after it and seek for it until you found it? And on finding it, wouldn't you come home and gently return it to the flock and then throw a party and rejoice with your friends that what was lost is now found? Now the second story is a lot like it. Verse 8. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and sink, seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So here again, we have that theme of something that was very dear being lost, and someone searches diligently until the lost is found, and then a bar party is thrown to celebrate that what was lost is now found. Now we go on to parable three, which is told by the master storyteller to fit the pattern of the other two stories, except something goes terribly wrong in story three. See if you can see it as we read it. Verse 11. And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far, far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him in his field, into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. He started his speech. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father interrupts him. Verse 22, But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older brother was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard the music and the dancing. And he called one of the servants. And he asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry, and he refused to go in. His father came out and begged him, but he answered his father, Look, boy, that's disrespectful. Look, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you, have never, yet you never gave me a 
young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. There are so many good things in that story. We don't have time to pull it all out and look at it this morning. Get Keller's book. You'll love it. You really will. You'll find his teaching to be sound, to be rich, and, and to be very insightful. But let me ask you, just for our purposes this morning, as this connects back to ch um, chapter 7 of 2 Corinthians, what went wrong here in this story? Jesus did it intentionally, but something is missing in that third story that was in the other two. What is it? Now, Jesus obviously told these three stories together because they have the same message for the Pharisees and the sinners and tax collectors alike. But this third story doesn't finish like the other two stories. It's not so nice and neat, a nice neat little package with a bow on it. No, Jesus intentionally leaves something out of this story. He leaves the plot unresolved. What was it? What's missing? See, in the first two stories, when the precious thing goes missing, what happened? Yeah, someone always went out to seek what was lost. But when we get to the third story, we hear about the son who's lost in a foreign land. And certainly Jesus' audience, whether it was the Pharisees or the, or the sinners, they expected this story to follow the pattern of the first two stories, and someone would go out and look for the lost son. The only question was, who? Who's going to go out? And they would look until they found him, regardless of the cost. But no one does. It really is surprising. Clearly, Jesus left that part out of the story so that his audience would ask, well, who should have gone out? And clearly the answer comes back, the elder brother in the parable should have gone out. That's what a true brother would do. In Genesis, when the elder brother Cain killed his younger brother Abel, God comes and asks about Abel. Cain barks back at God, what? Am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> and God's response basically is, yes, you are your brother's keeper. Now this isn't an easy thing, it's, it, 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 and it certainly isn't an easy thing in Jesus' parable. I mean, the younger brother had already cost his older brother very dearly. When he left, the father had to split his estate and sell off lands and holdings and livestock in order to give this spoiled kid half of the estate so he could go off and squander it. Now that meant that half the estate was now for the older brother. If the older brother were a true elder brother and he really did at cost to himself went out to seek his younger brother and find him, by bringing him back it meant that his portion of the estate would now be divided again. But the true older brother, a true older brother, would disregard the cost because of his love for his brother. Can you see that Jesus put this bitter, selfish elder brother in the story to make us yearn for a true elder brother? Does your heart yearn in the story for someone to do the right thing? Do you yearn for an elder brother who would seek and find his brother regardless of the cost to himself? Can you see that we are the younger brother in the story? And that we do have a true, compassionate, loving, older brother who didn't go to another country to find us. No, he left his home in heaven and came down here to earth to pay the ultimate price by submitting to the wrath of heaven in order to bring us into his family and ultimately to the greatest party ever for all eternity. See, our true elder brother paid our debt on the cross in our place without regard for the price. As Keller says in his book, Jesus was stripped naked of his robe and dignity so that we could be clothed with his royal robe of righteousness that we don't deserve. On that cross, Jesus was treated as an outcast, 
so that we could be brought into God's family freely by grace. There on the cross, Jesus drank from the cup of the wrath of God so that we might have the cup of the Father's joy. Forgiveness requires a price, and Jesus paid it all. When we were lost in the pigsty of our sin, Jesus paid it all. He came to seek and to save the lost. And now he calls us to do the same. He calls you and he calls me to take the place of the elder brother and to go out and to seek the lost, regardless of the cost to us. And make no mistake about it, folks, there is a cost. Jesus said it will cost you your life to do this. He said, if you will follow me, take up your cross, lay down your life, and follow me. God has entrusted to us the ministry of reconciliation. And he told us to pursue that ministry with Jesus as our model, who laid down his life for the lost. See, we take great pride in saying that salvation does not come by works. But that, in fact, is wrong. It is. Now, it's not that you or I can work for our own salvation, but there is not a child of God in this room here this morning who didn't come to Jesus because someone else worked to bring you the gospel. And now we have been given the same task. Whether we're seeking out an unbeliever who needs to find Jesus, or we're seeking out a brother or sister who's caught in sin, the duty falls to us to us because we are our brother's keeper. I mean, look at, look at Paul in our passage this morning. He was literally working himself into the ground as a true elder brother to bring Corinth the gospel and to bring them to maturity in Christ. In chapter 12, Paul's going to say, I will gladly spend and be spent for you. And he proves it with his life. The cost is inconsequential because the consequences are so dire. When Paul wrote his severe letter, he had no idea. He had no assurance that it was going to turn out well. And he he feared that his attempts to help his younger brothers would turn out poorly, and he might even push them farther away. Not just push them farther away from him, but push them farther away from Christ. But he trusted himself to God, and he did it anyway, even at the risk of offending someone. See, he could have just left the Corinthians in their sin wallowing in that pigsty. But that's not love. That's not what Jesus did for us. Jesus came here in the muck and the mire to win us to himself. And now he says to us, go you and do likewise. Let's pray. Father, we realize that whatever it is you've given us to do, you must also enable us to do it. These things are beyond us. Like Paul, we we fret and we worry about our attempts to help people. And we realize, Lord, that all we can do is preach your word from a good heart in sincere love for people and leave the rest to you but father in this day and age of tolerance please guard us from the sin of shutting up and leaving people in their sin because we're worried that it might hurt them help us to see the big picture i pray it in jesus name